In this tutorial, we're going to talk about molecular vibrational spectroscopy, which is a really cool technique, and it's got some long words there, but it's, it's not that hard to understand conceptually. So let's start with some atoms, and we're going to build a molecule. In this case, we're going to build an organic molecule. How about glucose, one of my favorite molecules to pick on? The atoms are connected through bonds, and, and that uses the electrons. The electrons are either shared or transferred between the atoms. So the electrons, once they're in a molecule like this or used in the bonds, form a cloud across the entire molecule. And what's interesting is, is there's a wave function across that electron cloud, and all the electrons share that same wave function, and that electron cloud be, can be excited into a higher state, and those states are quantized. So when we come to quantize energy, we go to an energy diagram, and we'll start with the ground state. And all molecules, or most of them at room temperature, are in the ground state. And we're going to draw the first excited electronic state. So we just drew a line higher up because it takes energy to get up to it. And there's more than the first. There's a second and third and so on and more than I would draw. And to excite this molecule into an excited state, we're going to use a photon. In this case, an ultraviolet photon that has enough energy to do it. And it will bring that electron cloud into an excited state. And this looks a lot like an atomic energy diagram. In other words, the energy diagram for electrons in an atom. But this is the entire set of all the electrons across the molecules because they share that wave function. So this is an excited molecular electronic state. Now, once it's excited here, it won't stay here. It wants to get back to the ground state. And it could do that from a few different methods. It can uh, get down through fluorescence or phosphorescence or some non-radiative method. So to kind of visualize this, when we put in the ultraviolet photon, it just excites that cloud, not the rest of the molecule, just the electron cloud. Now, there are other ways to put energy into a molecule, and this starts getting to the topic we're really here to talk about. Molecules can vibrate, and they can vibrate in a bunch of different ways, not just one or two. And their little appendages can also vibrate independent of their kind of main structure. These vibrational states are quantized. That's super important. In other words, it takes a unique amount of energy to make them vibrate. Not too little, not too much, just the right amount, and that molecule will absorb that energy and excite that vibrational state and vibrate. So to visualize these quantized energetic vibrational states, let's go back to our energy diagram and add some vibrational state energy levels. And those vibrational states take less energy than it takes to get to the electronic state. So it takes a lower energy, since we're using photons, a lower energy photon. And in this case, the photon would be in the infrared. So if we visualize that and send in an infrared photon, it will excite the molecule to a vibrational state. This is a mole molecular vibration, not a molecular electronic state. So see the difference in the two states? And it won't stay there long. It's going to decay really quick, uh, either probably through a phonon or heat. And it does it on the order of, of 10 to 100 picoseconds, depending on the molecule. So <clears throat> if we look at our molecule and we send in a photon of the wrong energy, which would be the wrong color, nothing happens. But if a photon has a correct energy or the correct color, it's going to get absorbed by the molecule and the molecule is going to go to that excited elect, uh, vibrational state and then release its energy in a phonon. This is infrared absorption. It absorbs infrared light by doing this because all these molecules, the energy needed to vibrate is in the infrared region. What's really cool about this is we can add a detector. If we add this detector on the far side of it and then we send in photons of a distribution of photons, but we know the colors of them, the ones that match the vibrational state will get absorbed and the ones that don't will go through and make it to the detector. So at the detector, we're going to look for the photons that are missing, the ones that got absorbed and didn't make it there. And we can plot that. And that creates a spectrum. Here we have infrared spectrum from a FTIR, that's Fourier transform infrared, which is how the optics are laid out to do this. And every on the on the x-axis, 
that's the range of colors we sent in. So that's sending in uh, different colors, but they're all infrared. These are all wavelengths we can't see. And they're all relatively low energy per photon. And on the y-axis, this is absorption. This is how much of, of the photons got absorbed that never made it to the detector. We have it drawn here as a positive peak. And so every peak there is an absorption by the molecule. It's a vibrational state. Every peak is the absorption from a vibrational, vibrational state. So those are all vibrational states we see. So let's bring the uh, molecule back in and kind of visualize it. Um, you have the main structure of the molecule. And when it vibrates, it has a lot of different ways it can vibrate. That creates this, this fingerprint region over on the left-hand side. That structure with all its little peaks is different for every molecule. And so we, we call those a fingerprint because it reminds us of human fingerprints. And you can go online and you can look at spectral libraries, infrared spectral libraries, and you could take an unknown sample and match it to those libraries and, and find what your chemical is by matching the position and relative amplitude of those peaks. Now also on this molecule, you got things kind of hanging off of it and they do vibrate with the molecule, but they can also vibrate rather independently. Like for example, uh, the uh, uh, CH bonds and the OH bonds on this particular molecule. And they end up way over here in what we call the high frequency range. Now they're, they have a tendency to more overlap with other molecules uh, because though they are unique, they're not as, they're, they're not as heavily coupled with the rest of the molecule. And so you can use this range to do analysis, but it's usually a little less informative because there's so much overlap from one molecule to another. Now, this all sounds well and good, but there is a big disadvantage. And that is that water happens to absorb all these wavelengths of light that we're trying to use. And so if you're measuring a solution that's water-based, it becomes pretty tough. And so that's one of the big disadvantages of infrared spectroscopy. So to summarize infrared spectroscopy, it gives a unique spectrum for each molecule. Fantastic, right? That's great. It requires some different kind of light sources because this is all in the mid infrared. You either need to use a, a Kelvin source, which is just like a red hot glowing filament. They're not very expensive, but they're not very bright either. Or you could use a quantum cascade laser, which are the up and coming way to do this. They're not cheap, they're expensive, but they make uh, higher intensity light and they're tunable. You could tune them through these wavelengths. Also to note, the optics are different in this, uh, to do this technique. Glass does not transmit mid infrared light. It, it will just look opaque. And so you have to either use reflecting optics or special materials that, that allow infrared uh, photons to go through them like silicon or germanium or zinc selenide. Uh, and just a reminder, water absorption is an issue. So uh, that usually pushes a cell. If you have a chemical in a, in a cell, uh, that cell has to be a little thinner, a shorter path length. That gives less water absorption, but also less signal from what you're trying to measure. So there's a whole other topic though that's worth discussing about and really interesting and that's scattering. Now, photons tend to scatter off stuff and photons will scatter off molecules. When a photon scatters and gets deflected a little bit, but there's no energy transfer, the photon remains the same color because color is energy. So if you change the energy, you change the color. Uh, this is called elastic scattering or Rayleigh scattering. Uh, it's where the photons kind of bounce off the molecule, but don't do any energy transfer. And generally speaking, that's what happened. That's also is why the, why the sky is blue is because of Rayleigh scattering on the molecules in the upper atmosphere. Uh, shorter wavelength mo uh, photons scatter more off these molecules. But something else can happen every now and then with rarity. Uh, during that scattering process, there can be an energy transfer. Even though the photon is not the right energy to match a quantized uh, energy state of the molecule, you sometimes get an energy transfer. And in that case, because there's energy transfer, we call it's an elastic scattering. And in this case, energy was lost from the photon. And so that's called Stokes scattering. And this is all part of Raman. So when we say Raman scattering, uh, this is the Stokes version of it. Let's go to our energy diagram 
and we already have the vibrational states. Now we have to add something new. We have to add virtual states. So a virtual state is not a real state. It's mostly here just for conceptual purposes. So with our energy diagram, let's look at Rayleigh scattering. A photon comes in. It doesn't match any of the energy states. It's too, it has too much energy to excite to a vibrational state, too low energy to excite to an electronic state. So what happens, it just drops right back down to the ground state and the photon goes on its way. That's Rayleigh scattering. But every now and then a photon will come in and it will go up to the virtual state, but not come back to the ground state. Instead, it's gonna go to one of the vibrational states. So now that energy is lost from the photon into the molecule. This only happens about one out of a million photons. So most of the time this doesn't happen, but one out of a million, it will happen. You just get that little randomness, randomness to it. Now, a different thing can happen, which is even less common. If the molecule is already in an excited vibrational state, then the photon that comes in will still go to a virtual state, when it's done with the virtual state, it will drop down to the ground state, and now energy is gained to the photon, lost from the molecule. This is less common because it requires the molecule to be already in an excited vibrational state, which typically they're not at room temperature at a ground state, they're not. But if you have a very hot molecule, it can be. And so this technique is used for really hot things. This is called anti-Stokes. Uh, it's still part of Ramon, it's still Ramon scattering, but energy is gained by the photon instead of lost. And as far as the probability this happens, it has to do with temperature and uh, the Boltzmann's distribution is what determines that probability. So why would you ever do any of this? If only one out of a million photons ever scatters the way you want it, why would you bother? Why not just do infrared spectroscopy? Well. The cool thing about Raman spectroscopy is it takes that same bond information, which on this uh, graph it's represented as that pink line over on the right hand side, and it moves it to wherever the laser is. That same information follows the laser. So if you look on the right, you have water absorption there, which is a big problem. And now over on the left, you have that vertical red line that represents a laser line. That bond information will follow that line. And so you can engineer your Raman shift uh, to whatever wavelength you want, depending on the laser and the sample that you're using. This is also where uh, uh, silicon detectors work really well. Normal, common, low-cost glass optics work really well. Even plastic optics can be used. Uh, so you only get one out of a million photons, but you can put it right in the in an area where we're we have a lot of technical support a lot of equipment and and optical techniques can be used and you can engineer that for uh different lasers as well the lasers are also low cost so the only thing about this is you need to have a very good spectral filter to block all those million laser photons so you see only the ramon shifted photons so a summary of ramon spectroscopy it has similar bond information, infrared spectroscopy, but you can use it in the visible and the near infrared and even the UV if you want. You can move your, your, your area of study around optically to whatever works with your sample and your optical system. Um, you need to have very good spectral filters because you have to block out a whole lot of the wrong light just to see the right light. And this is often plagued by fluorescence. There are a lot of molecules that fluoresce really heavily and create a lot of light that you don't want. And it can swamp your detector, it can saturate your detector with light, and you have to find a way around that either by changing your laser wavelength or doing some high-speed uh, optical gating. So a summary on vibrational spectroscopy as a whole, both infrared and Raman, um, both techniques yield unique spectrum for different molecules, and it's all based on those vibrational states which are the bonds of the molecules. So this is a molecular measurement, not an atomic measurement. It's important to note that all those vibrational states, they could be infrared active, which means they'll absorb an infrared photon. They could be Raman active, which means they have a probability of, of, of doing a Stokes shift on a, uh, on a photon. They could be both or they could be neither. So the two spectrum are similar, but not identical.
And finally, there is no one best technique. Depending on the, the sa your sample and what you're measuring and the environment you're measuring, you may have to use either infrared or Raman or some hybrid thereof. Um, you have to know enough about these techniques in your sample to know the right one to choose. Okay, I've hoped you enjoyed this tutorial and you learned something about vibrational spectroscopy. Thanks.